So today's text I've titled, It Gets in the Way. The story I read some time ago happened in May of 1954. It said that Roger Bannister became the first man in history to run a mile in less than four minutes. But within two months, a guy named John Landy eclipsed the record by 1.4 seconds. So in August of 1954, the two met together for a historic race, and as they moved into the last lap, Landy held that lead. It looked as if he would win, but as he neared the finish, he was haunted by the question, where is Bannister? So as he turned to look, Bannister took the lead, and Landy later told a Time Magazine reporter, quote, if I hadn't looked back, I would have won. And I think many times, your distractions and my distractions seem to get in the way of our progress. And that's kind of like where I'm going with the theme for today when I called it, It Gets in the Way. So if you turn over to 2 Samuel chapter 11, we're going to invest a considerable sum of time in this story. 2 Samuel chapter number 11 from the New American Standard Bible. And the story is a very long story, and we're going to jump into quite a bit of it. And for context, we're going to start in verse number 1 in 2 Samuel, chapter 11, starting in verse 1. It says, Then it happened in the spring, at the time when the kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the sons of Ammon and besieged Rabath. But David stayed at Jerusalem. Now, let me just back up momentarily and share a piece of this. That in that culture, the kings went out to battle with their troops. In fact, the kings were up front most of the time. They led the way. So David stayed in the background. David stayed back in Jerusalem. In verse 2, it says, Now when evening came, David rose from his bed, and walked around on the roof of the king's house. I'm in 2 Samuel chapter 11. He walked around on the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful in appearance. Now, let me pause again here. David would not have been able to notice Bathsheba, the woman, if he was at his proper place, which he should have been in battle, or at least with his warriors. In verse 3, so David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Verse 4. David sent messengers and took her. And when she came to him, they had relations. Verse 5. Then the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, Behold, I am pregnant. Bad news. Now, once again, I'll repeat it several times that this wouldn't have happened if David was where he was supposed to be at the time he was supposed to be. Verse 6, Then David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked concerning the welfare of Joab and the people in the state of the war. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. And, and that culture meant that you need to, you know, Hang out with the wife. So verse 9. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and didn't go to his own house. So again, this gentleman was called back from, from wartime and, and David was trying to cover his track, so to speak, if you can read between the lines. Verse 10. Now when they told David, saying, Uriah did not go to his own house, David said, Uriah, have you not come from a journey? And why did you, did you not go down to your own house? So verse 11 it was interesting. Uriah said to David, the ark and, and Israel and Judah are staying in this te temporary place, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in an open field, so then how can I go into my house and eat and have relations? Verse 12. Then David said to Uriah, stay here today also, and tomorrow I will let you go. So Uriah, again, I'm sharing the story for, for those who don't know the background of the story. So he remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Now David called him. And he ate and drank before him, and the king made this guy drunk. 
gave him more and more and more alcohol. And in the evening, he went out to lie on his bed and took him with the Lord's service, but he didn't go to his own house. Even after he was, he was plastered, he still had the decency and the forethought to hang out with the warriors. Verse 14. Now in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. Now think about this in a minute. Pay attention. Verse 15. He had written this letter saying, Place Uriah in the front of the fiercest bow and withdraw from him so that he may be struck down and die. This is the king. The king sending a message in Uriah's hand. He had his death warrant, if you will, in his own hand. Verse number 16. So it was about, as Joab kept watch on the city, that he put Uriah at the place where he knew there were valiant men. The men of the city went out and fought against Joab, and some of the people among David's servants fell, and Uriah the Hittite also died. So we're talking Bathsheba's husband also was put on the front line to be killed so that David could, quote, cover his tracks, okay? So he charged, and, but, um, number 18, uh, verse 18, then Joab sent and reported David all the events of war. He charged the messenger saying, when you have finished telling all the events of the war of the king, the king, and if it happened that the king's wrath rises and he says to you, why did you go so near to the city to fight? Did you not know that you would uh, shoot from the wall? Who struck down? So he goes through all these questions. Skip down to verse 20. Now when, verse 26, excuse me. Now when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband, verse 27. When the time of mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife, then bore him a son. But the thing that David had done was evil in the sight of the Lord. He was evil in the sight of the Lord. So when you and I choose not to do our duty, we open the door for distraction. Again, when you and I choose not to do our duty, we open the door to distraction. So if we are in the place that we're supposed to be and do what we're supposed to do, then there really isn't too much room for distraction. So we see in 2 Samuel chapter 12 that David still didn't get his job was to be at war with his men. So if you go over to 2 Samuel chapter 12, starting at about verse number 26, eventually the son that was born to Bathsheba passed away because David had done wrong and God punished him in this form. But I think that David must have forgotten what got him to the throne in the first place. Because if you back up some time, David was put in the throne because of his heart, because of his compassion, because of the, the tenderness of his heart. And then we see that there came a time that, uh, um, that David almost copied, in fact, I think did copy, some of the, the techniques, the evil means that Saul, the prior king, the first king, tried to, uh, tried to do for people that was threatening to him. Then Saul said to David, <clears throat> over in 1 Samuel chapter 18, uh, it says, here's my oldest daughter, Merib. I want to give her to you in marriage. Only, he says, a brave warrior for me and fight the battles for the Lord. So again, David copied the technique of of Saul in verse Samuel chapter 18. For Saul thought, there's no need for me to rise my hand against him. Let it be from the hand of the Philistines. So again, David in his formerly soft heart, Amen. his compassionate heart, learned from this evil first king of that region to do evil, to cover his tracks. So I would go back to 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 25. <clears throat> then David sent to the messenger, tell Joab, don't let this thing upset you. There's no way to anticipate whom the sword will cut down. Press the battle against the city and conquer it and encourage him with these words. So David was very intentional. David was adamant about getting rid of this husband that would eventually 
destroy, potentially destroy David's uh, authority, David's kingship, David's name, David's reputation. Because I would think that very few people knew at that time what David was doing. So if you go down to 2 Samuel again, verse 12, there came, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12, <clears throat> excuse me, we see a situation where Nathan was challenged to confront David. So in, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, in verse 1, it says, Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said, Now, now just think about this a minute as I read it. Verse 2. The rich man, so he, he told this story. Some, some, I've told you before here that oftentimes stories have more impact than facts. Stories have more impact than dictating. Stories have more impact of being direct. So again, 2 Samuel uh, chapter 12. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said, There were two people in one city, one rich and one poor. The rich man had a great many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he brought and nourished. And it grew together with him and his children. It would eat of his bread and drink of his cup and lie in his bosom. And it was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take from his own flock or his own herd to prepare for the wayfarer had come to him, but rather he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. And I'm in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse now 5. Then David's anger burned greatly against the man. Now think about what Nathan was doing to David. Again, then David's anger burned greatly against the man, and he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, Surely the man who has done this deserves to die. Now think about what David's saying. David didn't get it that Nathan was really talking about David, of, of the wrong that David did, right? True. So as the Lord lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die. He must make restitution for the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and had no compassion. Again, this is, this is Nathan, 2 Samuel chapter 12. This is Nathan having the guts to go to the king and tell him, in my terms, you royally messed up. But he used a story. He used a parable. I'm in verse 7 now. Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, it is I who anointed you the king over Israel. And he goes on to share uh, from God's voice you know, what, um, what God had done for David. Skip down to verse 9. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? I, I happen to believe that people who do evil typically don't do it accidentally. People who do evil do it, I think, more times intentionally. Skip down to verse uh, 11. Behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. Skip down to verse 13. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. So we see later on in the same chapter how, as I mentioned earlier, that the son of Bathsheba, the first son of Bathsheba, passed away. And then we read way down a bit more that in 2 Samuel chapter 16, it gets, it gets pretty, pretty um, graphic, really graphic, actually, because there came a time in, in this... Um, in this word to David, that he was told that some very nasty things were going to happen in his family as a result of his um, lack of better judgment, or a better way to say that is because of his sin, because of his wrongdoing. Because, in fact, he had the husband of Bathsheba killed so that he could get what he wanted when he wanted it. That's, a, that's a, probably another sermon. So David's son Absalom then would would kill another one of David's sons by the name of Ammon. And it, it, it kind of devolved into a situation where it got pretty, pretty graphic. Turn, down, turn over to 2 Samuel chapter 16, verse, starting in verse number 20. It says, Then Absalom said to Ahithophel, Give us your advice. And I'll just kind of maybe dance around what was said here. But they, they in essence said that this David's son was going to have relations with the concubines of David, which was a pretty dramatic um, 
uh, I'll just try to be careful in my words here, but it, uh, he, it was a pretty dramatic sign of revenge, if you will, of anger, of sin, of idolatry, a, a whole bunch of stuff that God foresaw, shared it with David, and said this was going to happen because of your stupidity, because of your sin. And I happen to think that you and I make waves with everything that we do. Now, granted, this situation happened thousands and thousands of years ago. But how many times haven't you seen situations in your own life that have created waves because of your lack of judgment, because of your lack of common sense, because of your sin, because of your errors, or because of your mistakes that, that you've created and I've created, that now we're paying the price for it, and sometimes other people are, paying, are also paying the price for it. Over in Psalm 32, there, there, there were times in, in David's life when he got it. In fact, I think he got it more than he didn't get it, thank God. But in Psalm 32, it says this, When I refused to confess my sin, my whole body wasted away. While I groaned in pain all day long, in Psalm 32, uh, uh, verse 4, For day and night you tormented me, you tried to destroy me in the, in the intense heat of summer. Then, verse 5, then I confessed my sin. Listen, I no longer covered up my wrongdoings, this paraphrase says. I said, I will confess my rebellious acts to the Lord, and then you forgave my sins. The more we try to cover up our stuff, the more eventually gets exposed. So why not do the right thing so you don't have to cover up whereby you're going to have to be exposed anyway? Doing the right thing is always the right thing to do in my world anyway. Matt Chandler writes, adoration drives obedience. Adoration drives obedience. But throughout history, he says, people are prone to forget the faithfulness of God yesterday. We're prone to forget what God has done for us through so many years. In fact, he says, if we fill our hearts with regrets of yesterday and with the worries of tomorrow, we have no today in which to be thankful. How many times haven't you uh, met people that say, I'm living today? Because you can't change yesterday. You certainly can't really change tomorrow. You can create situations in your life that, you can, that can give you a better tomorrow. But you can't change yesterday. You can't change the mess up you've done and the errors you've made. And so many of us have a tendency to, to live yesterday when we really can't change yesterday at all. You and I have the choice to do right or wrong. And when you say, when I say that we didn't have a choice or the flip Wilson comments, the devil made me do it, you know, it doesn't hold water too long because eventually we have to look in the mirror and say what happened is because of what I did. You know what I'm saying? And when we choose to do wrong, it will get in our way in the near future. So the text today, again, is it gets in the way. Our sins, our mistakes, our lack of better judgment gets in the way at some point. And as we see here in the story of David, that it not only impacts your life and my life, but it impacts a lot of other people's lives too. How many times haven't you made mistakes, crossed certain lines that you shouldn't have crossed, and then eventually you found out that as a result of that, that stuff has happened, situations have occurred, errors and judgments have made, and you've crippled the lives of other people that very candidly you shouldn't have had that negative impact in the first place because of your lack of judgment, because of your sin, because of, your, because of you being adamant to do what you wanted to do when you wanted to, to do it. Amen. David's intentional sins, listen, eventually cost the lives of many thousands of people. If you read the whole story, I'm not going to get into the whole story here today because it's a pretty long story based on what David did with Bathsheba. I mean, it just devolved into a complete disaster mm -hmm. because his choice to not do the right thing. In 1904, William Borden, heir to the Borden Dairy Estate, graduated from a Chicago high school, a millionaire. His parents gave him, gave him a trip around the world. Traveling through Asia and the Middle East and Europe gave Borden a burden for the world's hurting people. So writing home, 
He said, I'm going to give my life to prepare for the mission field. And when he made this decision, he wrote in the back of his Bible two words, no reserves, no reserves. Turning down a high paying job, offers after graduation from Yale University, he entered two more words in his Bible. Those two words were no reserves. Turning down a high paying job, and he went on, he, then he wrote two, two, two more words, no retreats. So completing studies at Princeton Seminary, Borden sailed for China to work with the Muslim community, stopping first in Egypt to get some stuff. And while there, he was stricken with cerebral meningitis and died within a month. A waste, you say, not in God's plan. In his Bible, underneath the words, uh, no reserves and no retreats, he had written the words, no regrets. And I think there are, there's a segment of every culture and every population and every zip code where a lot of people are living with regrets of stuff that they've done, the mistakes they've made, the sins they've not fallen into, they've walked into with their eyes wide open. And then they carry those regrets for a lifetime. So why, I can only ask myself, why do I, why do you choose to continue to walk in situations and create situations in your own life which produces regret. So again, the text today is, it gets in the way. Stuff gets in the way that doesn't need to get in the way. There, there, there was a Scotch writer a long time ago, and a historian a 19th century named Thomas Carlyle. He married a woman who worked as his secretary named Jane Welsh. But Carlyle was dedicated to his writing, so he didn't spend much time with her, and he just mostly wrote. At one point, she became ill, and it turned out that her illness was terminal, but Carlisle was too busy writing, and he didn't have much time for her. Then Jane died. When Jane died, they carried her to the cemetery for the service in a pouring rain, and following the funeral, Carlisle went back to his home. He went upstairs to Jane's room and sat down in the chair next to her bed. He sat there thinking of a little while, and the time he had spent with her and wishing so much he had the chance to do it differently. If only, noticing her diary on the table beside the bed, he picked it up and, and began to, to read it. Suddenly he was shocked. There on one page she had written a single line. There she wrote, yesterday he spent an hour with me. It was like heaven, I love him so. Something dawned on Carlisle that he had not noticed before. He had been too busy to notice that he had meant so much to her. He thought of all the times he had gone about his work without thinking or even noticing her. He turned a page in the diary, and there she, he, he read some more words that broke his heart. This is what she wrote. I listened all day to hear his steps in the hall, but now it is late and I guess he won't come today. Carlisle read a little more, and then he threw the book aside. He ran out of the house, and some of his friends found him at the grave. His face was buried in the mud, his eyes red from weeping, and tears just rolling down his cheeks. Over and over, he kept repeating the same phrase, if only I had known, if only I had known, if only. But it was too late. After Jane's death, Carlisle made little attempt to write again. He lived another 15 years, weary and bored and a, and a partial recluse. The story ends, I tell you, friends, that the two saddest words in the English language are, if only. That's because they indicate that there was a possibility to avoid a tragedy. There are many people who cannot see past their nose. There are many people who get so tunnel visioned on what they want when they want it that they don't see the impact that it has on other people's lives around them. And that's not only with young people. I think I can say categorically across the globe that young people, the majority, not all, but the majority of young people can choose to only see past their nose. They, they can't see many times what actions they, uh, they indulge in impacts people around them. Uh, one author said that there are certain things that you will not regret when you're older and greater. Showing kindness to an aged person. Being kind to a senior, in other words. How about, how about 
throwing away a letter that was written in anger. How many times haven't you been tempted to post, text, write, email, something uh, that you're so glad that you hit the delete button before you hit send because it would have turned out really bad? Number three, offering an apology that will save a friendship. How many times haven't you chosen to apologize and it produced a relationship that lasted for a long time? How, how, about, how about taking the, the time to show consideration to people who have impacted your life in some way? Again, these are things that you'll never regret. How, how, about, how about refusing to do a thing that's wrong although others do it. That is, doing the right thing whether or not somebody's watching you or not. You know what I'm saying? How, how, how about, about doing the right thing even though that other people are doing the wrong thing? Mm -hmm. The older I get, the more I want to leave this world with less and less regrets. Less and less regrets. There's a, there's a story and a movie that was out, which I never saw the whole movie, uh, called Mr. Holland's Opus. And it's about a, a teacher that, that really thought that he wasted all these years and, and nothing really happened and he wasn't able to make a difference in people's lives. So the, the movie goes on, I'm told, and toward the end of the, of the, the film, the governor of, is none other than a student of this instructor. So the instructor get, gets up and, and, and speaks and they say, quote, Mr. Holland had a profound influence in my life on a lot of lives, I know, and yet I get the feeling that he considers a great part of his life misspent. Rumor had it that he was always working on this symphony of his, and this was going to make him famous and rich, and probably both. But Mr. Holland isn't rich, and he isn't famous. At least, not to others outside this little town. So it might be easy for him to think of himself as a failure, but he'd be wrong. Because I think he's achieved a success far beyond riches and fame. Looking at her former teacher, the governor gestures with a sweeping hand and continues, look around you. There is not a life in this room that you have not touched, and each of us is a better person because of you. We are your symphony, Mr. Holland. We are the melodies and the notes of your opus, and we are the music of your life. So you and I see over and over again that we did not have, we have an option, I should say, to create situations in our lives whereby we can leave music, we can leave legacies, we can leave waves, we can leave ripples in other people's lives if we, lives, if we live our lives in such a way that it brings honor not only to God but the people around us. If you turn over to 2 Samuel chapter number 22, as David really looks back at his life, we see at least part of David's successes. Now, he's had some failures, granted, but I think more times than not, he had more successes than he had failures, but we have a tendency, at least some of us, to focus on the failures instead of what went well. So in 2 Samuel chapter 22, starting in verse number 35, David was giving glory to what God had done. 2 Samuel chapter 22, starting in verse number 35. He says, he trains my hands for battle. My arms can bend even the strongest bow. Again, this was written several thousand years ago. You give me your protective shield. Your willingness to help enables me to prevail. You widen my path. My feet do not slip. I chase my enemies and destroy them. I do not turn back until I wipe them out. You cannot, they cannot get up. They fall at my feet. You give me the strength for battle. Think about where David's giving credit at the moment. You make my foes kneel before me. You make my enemies retreat. I destroy all those who hate me. Verse number 42. They cry out, 
but there is no one to help them. They cry out to the Lord, but he does not answer them. I grind them as fine as the dust to the ground. I crush them and stomp on them like clay in the streets, this paraphrase says. You rescue me from a hostile army. You preserve me as a leader of nations. Again, think about what David's doing. He's giving credit to God, who, as I say, uh, have said many times, who butters his bread, right? Verse 45 Foreigners are powerless before me. When they hear of my exploits, they submit to me. Foreigners lose their courage. They shake with fear as they leave their strongholds. The Lord is alive. My protector is praiseworthy. The God who delivers me is exalted as king. Verse 48. The one true God completely vindicates me. He makes nations submit to me. He delivers me. Listen, verse 49. He delivers me from my enemies. Kind of reminds me a little bit of the 20 heart song, just a little bit, doesn't it? You snatch me from those who attack me. You rescue me from violent men. So I will give thanks. Listen, verse number 50. So I will give thanks, O Lord, before the nations. I will sing praises to you. He gives, listen, he gives, God gives his chosen king magnificent victories. He is faithful to his chosen ruler, to David and his descendants forever. I, I, I don't know about you, but oftentimes when you realize that you mess up, I mean royally mess up, if you're smart, then you realize who butters your bread. And David was saying right here, he realizes who butters his bread. He realizes that, you know what, even though I messed up, I know who sets me up. I know who takes me down, right? So the author of 2 Samuel wants to make it very clear that, that God is the hero. God is the one who deserves all the praise in his life. So there, there's, there's a big takeaway in, in David's life, at least in this part of David's life. He started out with pure intentions. He started out with a, with, with, with a clean heart, if you recall. But David placed himself in situations placed himself in situations that created filth in his life, that created dirt in his life, that created sin in his life, that eventually impacted thousands of people. How many times haven't you and I placed ourselves in situations that have created messes for us and other people that have been disastrous because we've chosen to take certain roads, we've chosen to take certain actions, use certain words, of get into certain habits that not only impacted our lives, but impacted other people's lives around us. So if you skip over to the New Testament for just a minute, I'll end with some good stuff. Now here's what our model should be. Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 5. Your attitude should be the kind that was shown to us by Jesus Christ, who although he was God, did not demand and cling to his rights as God, but laid aside his mighty power and his glory, taking the disguise, this paraphrase says, of a slave and becoming like men. And he, listen, and he humbled himself even further, going so far as actually to die, actually to die a criminal's death on a cross. Now think about that a minute. I mean, we've heard the story and we know the story very well. But if you just pause and think about that act, that Jesus chose to step down and do the things that he didn't have to do for the sake of other people, millions of people now. And I wonder if, if, if is that not supposed to be an example for all of us, that we're supposed to be willing to step down and do the right thing regardless of other people who are doing the wrong thing around us. Jim Rohn writes, we must all suffer from one of two pains. The pain of discipline or the pain of regret? He said the difference of discipline weighs ounces while regret weighs tons. Ooh, this last part really grabs me every time. The difference of discipline that weighs ounces while regret weighs tons. How many times haven't you looked back in your own life and still today, the incident may have happened 30 years ago. But that weight of that stupidity, that, that weight of that sin, weight of that mistake, weight of that lack of common sense still gets on your nerves. So wouldn't it be smarter for all of us to 
walk a walk to live a life where we have less and less regrets because we think about the impact that we that everything we do everything that we say everything that we post nowadays everything we email everything that we text everything that we put out there can either influence people positively or negatively or put you in a light that's not so good that lasts forever now if it's on the web it's there forever and it's accessible so these days we have to be even more careful what we do because it does in fact last forever psalm 51 a paraphrase of it says in verse 17 it is a broken spirit you want remorse and uh, penitence a broken and contrite heart oh god you won't ignore a humble heart a heart that understands that you're there i'm there to serve you're there to understand that you're not really in charge you're just a vessel you're a tool in people's hands to bless people to to bring people up, to encourage people, to do what only you can do in the way you can do it. David got that in, in the beginning. And then he was, he thought that he was too powerful. He thought he was too good. He, he thought that he didn't have to lead from the front. So David stayed back in Jerusalem, got himself in trouble. Bill Gates writes, treatment without prevention is simply unsustainable again treatment without prevention is simply unsustainable now he's talking about something that's not in this context but I, I think it's really powerful here too that if we're proactive to do the right thing it's a whole lot easier to do the right thing than have to deal with the issues of doing the wrong thing afterwards it's like good health you know you want to take care of your, of your health on the front end so you don't have to deal with uh, issues in the back end because you didn't deal with your health on the front end. You know what I'm saying? Because prevention is better than a cure. In fact, the, the Bible uses it in a more flowery way that says obedience is better than, than sacrifice. That is, doing the right thing is better than saying I'm sorry for doing the wrong things. That's my turn of phrase. Doing the right thing is better than apologizing for doing the wrong things. So again, the title of the text today is called, It Gets in the Way. And oftentimes we walk in situations, we place ourselves in environments where we have no business being. We don't need to be there. We don't need to be in that zip code at all. And first, in the Philippians chapter 3, and I've shared this story multiple times because it always, always grabs me by my collar. For those who don't know, there was a guy in the New Testament named Saul, and Saul was a, 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 um, a terrorist, if you will. He was a terrorist of this new Christian group, this new Christian religion. And uh, Saul was a Jewish guy. He was a very intelligent, schooled leader in the Jewish community. And they were, that culture was determined to, to stop out this new Christian doctrine. So eventually Saul helped assassinate people, and he, he was very much active in getting rid of many of these people. And then there came a time when Saul was confronted with Christianity, and I'll use those terms mildly, and he saw the, the, the light in a very direct way. But Saul could have walked through, who eventually became Paul, by the way, he could have had a lot of regret. But over Philippians chapter 3, he says this, he says, I press on. He says, I forget those things which are behind. Think, think about this a minute. Saul Paul was a terrorist. Uh, again, that's a loose term, my term, not a biblical term. And he could have had a lot of regrets. But again, he says, I press on. He says, I forget those things which are behind. And I reach forward to those things that are ahead. I'll say it multiple times here today. But it is very difficult to forget the stupid stuff you've done in the past. In fact, it almost needs to be a, an intentional act for you and I to live our lives in such a way that we create environments in our lives, i.e. being so busy doing better things and good things and blessing other people that you don't have time to worry about and regret the stuff, the stupid stuff you've done in the past. 
So for me, I think, it's saying, let, let me continue to what, what Paul said. He said, I reach forward to those things which are ahead. So again, that kind of echoes what I just said. That if you are reaching forward to the things that are ahead, then your focus is what? Ahead. When you stop, when you get lazy, when you get tired, when you get weak, then what happens pretty quickly, then you start remembering all those stupid things that you did years ago that you can't change, you can't go back and fix because it is what it is. So if I take Paul as an example, that if Paul could press on, as the text says, and forget the people that he helped kill. Now that, that's a big deal. I'm not talking just getting a speed ticket five years ago and you oh, you regret if I would have slowed down. Or you know you did something a whole lot worse than that. I mean we're talking he helped people get killed. I mean, he, he was, he was in, in the middle of all this, right? He could have very easily had that baggage on him, but it doesn't say that. It says he forgot those things, he's forgetting those things, but he's pressing forward. So shouldn't you and I mirror our lives in a way that eventually David got it in the Old Testament, I didn't read it, but David eventually got it, that he messed up and he was trying to fix his life from there forward. Right? And although he had other stuff going on around him in the family as a result of his stupidity, he was adamant at the end of his life to realize that, you know what, I really messed up. God's still in control. I need to surrender whatever I'm trying to do to God's control. So you and I can't change the wrong that was done in the past. We can't. Because it is what it is. I mean, what happened, happened. We must live, though, a, a proactive life, a proactive life to do what's right instead of walking in situations that you're, that you're going to regret. And all of us have those regrets. Some of them, like I said, are small regrets, and some of them are, are huge regrets. But I'd say more than half the time, you, you, you can't change that stuff you've done in the past. So from here forward, at least, I think it's, it's critical that you and I live a life that honors God, that we do the right thing, even if nobody's watching. So these little things that you think that you're getting by with or that you're tempted to do that you think nobody will ever know anyway, you know, God knows. And eventually it's going to be found out. It might not be today. It might not be next week. But eventually, that stupid stuff you consistently do is going to be found out. So why not do the right thing? Why not stay out of the situations that you place yourself in consistently that will eventually come back and haunt you, that will eventually create regrets in your life, that will be tempting to you to keep looking back at yesterday, that you really you can't change yesterday. You can only focus on today and what's going to happen tomorrow. Thank you.